Welcome to this video on pre-processing by Phoenix FEM. My name is Raja Nandaraja, Director of Courses Provider, formerly a Geotechnical Professor at Johns Hopkins University. What I like to do in this video is to go through the steps of pre-processing for this simple two-dimensional footing induced consolidation problem. A nine meter thick clay layer is sandwiched between two sand layers water table is at a depth of one meter the width of the footing is ten meters the total length of the domain to be analyzed is fifty meters and the total uh, height of the domain to be analyzed is sixteen meters in terms of boundary conditions we would uh, fix the base of the domain we would place rollers on the sides and we would uh, impose zero excess pore water pressure at this level where the water table is and also at this level uh, at the base of the uh, domain. We would use the linear elastic isotropic stress strain model to represent the stress strain behavior of the clay and the sand. We would like to develop the data from scratch to get to the pre-processing interface, this is what you do. You click on this continue button, click on the general use button, click on this first button, and then click on the pre-processing first job button. You are in the pre-processing interface. Each of these buttons represents a step to be completed. When you click on one of those, it will take you to an interface allowing you to complete that particular step. You come back to this form again, and repeat until you complete all of the required steps. So let's get, get started. We are creating a new job, so click on this button and then uh, select a work folder and then select a name for the job. I'm going to select an existing name, TEM1. It has to be a four letter name. You don't need to type the extension if it's this is the this is a new job. Uh, click save, and this particular button will uh, ha has turned red, and that's what will happen every time you complete a step. The corresponding button will turn red. The next thing you do is to click on this control parameter button answer a few questions. These, these questions are designed to narrow down the problem. So what we have is a consolidation problem. I'm going to click over here and for question number two I'm going to click on the saturated material button and we are going to conduct a fully coupled uh, analysis by the UP formulation. So I'm going to click on this button right there and uh, we have a plain strain problem. Uh, we will be using solid elements to model the soil and we will also be using some bending elements to model the footing so I'm going to say yes to that and uh, we will not be slaving any nodes so answer to that question is no. We will not be using any springs or masses. So there are a few more questions. Click on this button to get to the get to those questions. And um, question number no, uh, nine, you type in the uh, value of the atmospheric pressure in consistent units. We will be using SI units, and the atmospheric pressure is 100 kilopascal. Uh, we will not be using any st stage construction or excavation. So the answer to that question is no and we would be using the linear elastic isotropic model and only one, one uh, stress strain model and therefore answer to that question would be just one and then we pick that number from this pull down menu and then select the model isotropic linear elasticity from this pull down menu and we want to use two sets of parameters one for the clay one for the sand uh, so we select number two from that pull down menu. That's it. We have answered all the questions. And the next thing you want to do is to click on this button called process button. And you'll be doing that in pretty much all the 
remaining uh, form. So let's click on that and that button will turn red. Uh, go back to the main uh, form using that forward, I mean the backward navigation arrow. So we have completed that step, control parameter set step. Again you can see that button has turned red. Now the next thing you want to do before you go to the next step is to save. Alright, so every time you complete a step make sure you save so that you don't lose the data that you have generated up until that point. So let me click on that and see a little blue bar on the upper right corner and make sure you wait until that disappeared before you continue. Now that we have completed the control parameter step, the colors of this button become meaningful. The buttons corresponding to the steps that need to be completed become silver and the buttons corresponding to the steps that uh, are irrelevant to the problem become lavender. Now, if I click on one of these buttons like boundary conditions, it gives you a message says, saying some earlier steps have not been completed, please do them first. What that means is the steps that need to be completed are to be completed in sequence. So you do have to go down this list one by one in sequence. Let's go ahead and work on the solid element step. Let's look at the problem one more time. The domain has a total length of 50 meters and a height of 16 meters. Phoenix FEM currently supports uh, a structured mesh. So basically you take the domain and divide that up into a number of uh, quadrilateral blocks. And then you define the density of elements within each block in a consistent manner. Phoenix FEM will then take it from there and create the mesh for you. Now just to keep things simple, I'm just going to use one big block for the whole domain. The block is going to have a length of 50 meters and the height of 16 meters and it is rectangle. And I'm going to put the coordinate axis right here at this left bottom left corner. Alright, so to start, you click on this button and it will take you to the interface uh, that allows you to create the mesh. So first thing we do is to define the size of the domain because right now the, the graphical user interface does not have a scale to draw the picture in this graphical window. So it needs to know the size of the domain. So our maximum uh, X coordinate is 50 meters and the maximum Y coordinate is 16 meters. And you click enter. Now it has a scale. So then what we do is we basically draw four lines in order to create that big rectangular block that I was talking about. So let's start. Pick a new line from this pull down menu and the first line is going to have to be done manually. So we type in the uh, starting coordinate. I'm going to draw the the bottom horizontal line first. So it goes from 0, 0 to 50, 0. And then you click on the Add Modify button and that line will be registered. So you can see that it had drawn a horizontal line from node 1 to node 2 and the details of that line are kind of summarized in this display box right there. So let's go ahead and draw a second line starting from this node going up to a height of 16 meters. So since I'm starting from this node, we can make use of one of these facilities that we have right here, snap facility. So I'm going to use the snap node facility for that. So click on that and then click on this button and come and click somewhere here nearby and it'll draw a little circle around that node. It basically snaps onto that node. And then this over here obviously 
uh, I don't have a basis for using any of those facilities, so I'm going to have to do this manually. X coordinate of that is zero, and the Y coordinate of that is 16 meters. So I click at modify, and that line is also uh, registered. Now let's go ahead and do a third line starting from this line going horizontally to a length of 50 meters. So again I can use the snap node feature for that. And then the horizontal coordinate of the second point is going to be 50 meters and the height is 16 meters which is already there. So I click on the at modify um, over there. So now I need to close this and I have two ways to do. I can uh, use the snap node like we have done so far or I can use the snap vertical feature. So since I have not done that, uh, let me show you how that is done. So let me click on that and click on the X coordinate of that vertical line which is 50 meters and click over here and then come and click over here somewhere. Alright, so it's going to draw a circle around that node uh, because it knows that the vertical line has a horizontal coordinate of 50 meters. And then click over here and then click over here. Alright, and then click on the Add Modify button. So now it has drawn the fourth line and it closed the, um, uh, the rectangle. Um, so the element type that we want to use is eight noded quadrilateral element. Okay. And then click on the auto generate button right here. So when you do, it kind of defines the block in the proper way because the node surrounding the block is going to have to be um, arranged in a counterclockwise sense. So now you can see that these nodes have been rearranged to go in the counterclockwise direction, one, two, three, uh, one, two, four, and three, and those are listed right here, one, two, four, and three. So this display box gives you the details of the of the block, and also it defines a direction for the block. And this direction is now considered to be direction one, and this is the the one normal to that is considered to be the direction two. All right. So this nx, ny are defined with respect to those directions. nx kind of go in that direction, ny go in the uh, direction perpendicular to that. But they don't have to coincide with the global x and y coordinate. These are only for the purpose of defining the element densities and the uniformity coefficient. So, so the um, the graphical user interface doesn't know that. So we're going to have to define that manually. So what we do is we click on this item and these boxes will be loaded up with whatever we have in the memory right now. And then we come in here and modify this. So I'm going to use uh, a, uh, a number of elements of 45 in the horizontal direction and the number of elements of, let's see, um, 14, maybe like 19. No, let me see, 14, 15, 16 in the vertical direction. So basically, uh, that'll create um, elements having a size of one meter in the uh, in the vertical direction. I'm going to keep things uniform, so that means these coefficients will have to be one here and one there. So the element size would be constant, both in the horizontal direction and the vertical direction. And we click at modify. All right. So make sure those changes are reflected in the in the the list in the display box. So NX has changed to 45 and NY has changed to 16. Recall it was like 1 and 1 before. Alright, so that's it. So that's all we had to do here. And now you click on the process button and then do the processing internally and create the 
uh, mesh for you. there it is so this is the mess we mesh we have created and uh, now you can go backwards using the backward navigation error and you are done with that step let's now go ahead and create some bending elements to model the footing let's click on this button and you are in the bending elements interface now since the overall size of the domain uh, after we place the bending elements is going to be the same as the uh, size of the domain uh, without the bending elements we don't need to change anything over here let's pick a new set now you have three different options standalone stick element is what you would use to model a superstructure uh, embedded stick element is what you use to model uh, bending elements that are either on the soil or buried in the soil uh, but they are thin enough that the volume occupied by them uh, is insignificant. Uh, if the volume occupied by the bending elements is significant then you should be using the embedded thick, thick element option which will allow you to create gaps and place the bending elements inside the gap. Alright, so let's go ahead and click on the embedded stick element option now the footing is not pinned at either end and therefore we should be selecting those options now I'm going to type the uh, end coordinates of the footing manually here although you do have the click and pick options but it's a little confusing right now um, therefore I'm going to type them manually uh, but if you uh, if the click and pick is convenient you should be using that alright so the starting point of the footing is 20 meters and uh, height is 16 ending x coordinate is 30 meters and the height is still 16 alright young smart dealers I'm going to use a value of 5000 kilopascal I'm going to use a value for the Poisson ratio 0.3 and I'm going to assume the footing to be rectangle with a thickness of 0.5 meters so that will give me a second moment of inertia of 0 0.0104 uh, meter to the power of 4 and then the cross-sectional area is going to be 0.5 because it's a plane strain problem the cross-sectional area has a dimension 0.5 meters by 1 meter mass density is zero since uh, we are not modeling the dynamic effects uh, element type there are three different element types we'll be using regular element here but if you are uh, creating a mesh to conduct an excavation or construction type analysis then you could consider using one of the other types all right so that's it we have basically filled uh, all of the required uh, boxes here so let's click on the add modify button and as soon as you do you can see it basically creates a line from the start starting point to the end point and also it lists uh, a summary gives you summary in the display box uh, if you click on that item it basically highlights the bending element uh, next step is to click on the process button as soon as you do uh, the color changes to red and also it has now uh, done a detailed processing behind the scene and figured out exactly how to uh, subdivide the footing into bending elements and also how to bond the bending elements to the soil element alright that's basically it and you can come out using that button and make sure you save it let's go ahead and work on the next step in the sequence which is boundary condition specifications now since we are using the fully coupled UP formulation in general there could be two types of boundary conditions the first type has to do with the specification of displacement slash loads the second type has to do with the specification of excess pore pressure slash fluid flux 
Now, if you do have uh, either displacements or excess pour water pressure, you have to specify them explicitly, regardless of whether you have zero value or non-zero value. Uh, on the other hand, if you do have a uh, load or a fluid flux boundary condition, you have to specify them only if you have non-zero values. All right. Um, there are four lines here where we have the displacement slash load type boundary conditions, which are the left edge, the right edge, the base, and the footing. Uh, there are two lines here where we have the excess pore pressure slash fluid flux type boundary condition, which is the base where we're going to uh, set the excess pore pressure to zero, and then at the level where the water table is where excess pore pressure is going to be set to zero again. All right, let's start. Let's pick a new set. And I'm going to use the line option slash constant value um, values button. And uh, we can use the click and pick uh, feature in order to define the starting coordinate and the end coordinate for these lines. So let's work on the um, left edge first. All right, so we have defined the coordinates for the end point, I mean the starting point and the end point. Now then you pick the type, zero for the displacement slash load, and type number is three for pore pressure slash fluid flux. So we're going to pick zero, and then um, zero if the, specific, if the condition in the x direction is a load condition, and if the condition in the x direction is a zero displacement condition, the flag is going to be one, and if it's a non-zero displacement, it's going to be two. So right now, it's going to be one in the x direction because we want, we want to place rollers which prevent the displacement from uh, taking place. So the displacement is going to be zero. And similarly, you pick the flag for the y direction, and rollers for rollers, uh, the condition in the y direction is going to be a zero load. All right, uh, the values uh, of these quantities are zero displacement in the x direction, zero load in the y direction. You click at modify, and you can see that the graphical user interface has drawn a line along the left vertical edge um, uh, from the starting point to the end point. And also, it has listed uh, an item in the display box summarizing our choices for set number one. And if you click on that, it'll highlight uh, the, uh, the line. All right, uh, go ahead and pick a new set. Let's do the base now. Starting point, end point, type is still zero, and I have a zero displacement and a zero displacement in the y direction as well. At uh, modify, pick a new set, starting point, end point, zero and zero for the flag in the x direction, and uh, I'm sorry, one for the flag in the x direction, zero for the flag in the y direction at modify. New set, starting point, end point, zero is the type, flag in the x direction is now going to be zero and the flag in the y direction is going to be zero, and the values are zero in the x direction, but in the y direction, I'm going to put, let's say, minus 200 uh, kilopascal at modify. Pick a new set. Starting point, end point, 
Now the type is 3. I want to specify 0 excess pore pressure along the base of the domain. So type is 0, I mean 3. Flag in the x direction is 1 because that's a 0 pore pressure. And flag in the y direction is irrelevant and therefore you don't have to worry about it. The values are 0 and 0 at modify, new set, starting point is right there, the end point is right there. These things remain the same, type is 3 and 1 for the flag in the x direction. Now remember pore pressure is a scalar, so uh, they don't have directions. Uh, so only the flag in the x-direction is relevant and the flag in the y-direction is not relevant. Uh, at modify, that's it. So we have six sets defined here and all six sets should be listed in the uh, box there. So click on the process button and then you are done. You can come back to the main form. Um, all right, so make sure you save it. Now, if you do want to make sure that the boundary conditions have been done properly, you can always go to the plot uh, pull down menu and click on this over here and then it kind of tells you how you could examine the uh, precise nature of the specification. So let's say set number one, direction one, I click on execute, it tells you the nodes where the boundary conditions have been imposed. So you close that, set number two, direction number one, execute, it tells you the base and so on. So you can, you can use this to verify or confirm the boundary condition specific specifications one more time. Alrighty. Let's go ahead and define the solid element material properties now. In that there are four four boxes at the very top. The first box lists the constitutive model that we have selected for this problem. If you recall, we have selected the linear elastic model. We have selected only one which is the linear elastic model. If I click on that, see what happened over here. Uh, it has placed some labels and um, it has filled in some of the boxes with some typical numbers for you. Linear elastic model requires the Young's modulus and the Poisson ratio. And on top of that, since we are doing the fully coupled uh, uh, analysis, uh, the analysis now requires some additional parameters including the bulk modulus of the solids, bulk modulus of the fluid, permeability, porosity, mass density of the solid, fluid, and there's a parameter called alpha which is one for soil and it could be a little different for materials like rocks. So some of these have already been filled in and uh, in most cases you only have to fill the empty boxes. All right. In the second box, it lists the number of sets that we we wanted to use. Remember, we wanted to use two different sets: one for sand and the other one for clay. Uh, so let's click on number one first. All right. Um, now, if you are not sure what values to start with, um, th there there is there is a built-in database. Um, and for the linear elastic model, it has filtered the database and and uh, sh showing you the sets that are available in the database. So if I click on, for example, set number one, isotropic elastic, all right, it basically will fill these boxes with the numbers in the, the in the database. At least it gives you some idea. Um, but then you can go ahead and modify the numbers to reflect the material that you're working with. And similarly, 
there are two sets listed here for the fully coupled parameters. One is for the SI units and the other one is for the British units. So let me just click on the the set for the SI units. It will again fill the boxes with the numbers in the database. So we'll just modify these. All right, uh, let's say set number one is the one that we want to use for sand. And I want to use a Young's modulus of 5,000 kilopascal for sand. And if you recall, it's the same value that we have used for the fooding. So the fooding will have the same value as the as the sand that the f that it is in contact with. All right, and I want to use. Uh, I'm I'm going to leave the 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 bulk modulus of the solid. Um, and the bulk modulus, the fluid unchanged because they are good, they don't need to be changed. Um, the mass density of the solid is 2.7, which is also a good value. Ma uh, well, I mean, in fact, I could change that to zero since uh, we are not doing a dynamic analysis like an earthquake analysis. I could change the mass density of both the solid and the fluid to zero. Por uh, porosity. 0.42 is good. I'm going to leave it as is. And I'm going to change the permeability to 1 times uh, minus 9. Okay? 1e minus 9. Now, right now, it's set up so that you can actually use a tensorial permeability. Uh, if you do have a you know, if you do have different values in different directions, uh, you could use different values for K11, K22, uh, and K33. But right now, I am assuming isotropic material, and therefore my K11, K22, K33 are all equal to each other, and also the off diagonal terms are zero. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, uh, these are the values that I want to use for uh, clay. So this is sand, and my permeability value is minus 3. I want the permeability to be about a million uh, less than the permeability of the clay layer. So for clay layer, we'll use 1e minus 9, but for here, uh, I, I want to use 1e minus 3. Okay? All right, everything looks okay. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, add. Click on the Add Modify button to register this, and then set number two. Um, and I want the Young's modulus to be 500, about 10 times less than the Young's modulus of the uh, of the of the sand layer, and I want the permeability to be. 1e times minus 9, 10 to the 9, minus 9 there, and minus 9 there. And also, you may want to note that this, these are not really permeability, but permeability divided by the density of water. Okay, so K divided by gamma W uh, is what these are. All right, let's click on the Add Modify button and both sets have now been defined. And now the third box uh, lists the uh, sets that we have defined thus far. All right, so let's click on the process button and let's go out. And uh, so now if you come back in, uh, these sets obviously would be there. Like if I click on this and click on this and click on this, you will see the values that we typed in. Um, being used to fill the boxes, and if I click on that, click on that, you'll see the set for the um, clay. All right, let's go ahead and save this. Let's go ahead and assign material numbers now. We have two different options, horizontal layer option and block option. Since the material properties don't change in the horizontal direction for us, we can use the horizontal layer option. Basically, there are three layers with distinct properties. There's a sand layer at the bottom, clay layer in the middle, and a sand layer at the top. So there are three sets. Let's start with the new set. 
horizontal layer option and I'm going to assign the uh, numbers for the sand layer at the bottom which is parameter set number one starting point for that layer you click somewhere at that level it could be anywhere and you click at the top of the layer that will be the ending point for that layer click at modify pick a new set clay layer which is going to be represented by parameter set number two starting point end point click at modify new set sand layer starting point end point click at modify we are done now you can see that our choices have been summarized in the display box here as well and if you click on one of these it will highlight click on the process button before you come out and if you do want to see more details about the material number assignments you can always go to the plot pull down menu and click on the show material number regions click on the show all regions and click execute and it will show you exactly what it had done there are two buttons here maybe the first time we're encountering this button um, if I click on this button right here it will take you back to the form that you just came from uh, whereas if I click on this button here it will take you all the way back to the main form which we could do right now since we are done with the specification and the material numbers uh, interface go ahead and save the problem next let's work on the solid element state variables in general if you are using only elastic constitutive model there are no plastic internal variables associated with that and therefore typically you don't have to define state variables but in in the present case since we are doing a fully coupled analysis the graphical user interface allows you to define initial stresses in some cases uh, you may be interested in um, modeling liquefaction, soil liquefaction uh, so it might be of interest to start from the proper initial effective stress to see if the material is going to be actually liquefying or not so that's the purpose of that so let's go in there and there are two options here to define initial stresses uh, the first one is called the small stress option and this is what we you would use if you want to actually generate the initial stresses for something like an embankment or something like this so you start from some initial values for the stresses and then you conduct a gravity type analysis in order to establish the initial stresses at various points within the domain but that's not what we want to do we would use the K0 stress option and this is good for uh, horizontal uh, soil deposits provided you have a value for K note uh, which will uh, help you define the horizontal principal stresses uh, on the basis of the vertical principal stresses alright so there are two options here um, first is to define the initial uh, values of the stresses and the second is to define the initial values of the hardening variables which are the plastic internal variables so let's click on the first one and now it takes you to the interface to define the initial stresses based on the K0 uh, concept so basically your vertical stresses are calculated uh, using this type of formula like sum of gamma multiplied by H kind of formula so you're going to define the densities and the layer thicknesses for each of the layers and then uh, the horizontal stresses are going to be calculated on the basis of the value of the K node that you type in here so number of layers uh, let's just say we have uh, three layers well let's make it four since we have a water table within the first sand layer 
and the total thickness h uh, since we are placing our coordinate axes at the the bottom left corner uh, the h for our problem is 16 um, meters and we don't want to apply any initial stresses uh, surface pressures uh, that'll be zero and there are two different options here uh, you can either input density and calculate the stresses which is what we want to do and the other is to directly read in the vertical stresses but we want to choose option number one here and click enter it get, kind of gives you a little warning that if you are using doing a elastoplastic type analysis you want to make sure that there are <laughs> excuse me there are some initial stresses at every point uh, within the domain. So sometimes it helps to put um, uh, a certain surface pressure in order to make sure even the initial stress is close to the ground level um, uh, at points close to the ground level is not zero. So you won't run into numerical problems during the elastoplastic analysis. Alright, so we, that's not what we are doing. We have a elastic constitutive model and that is not necessary here. All right, so now we pick layers one at a time, uh, going from the top to bottom. And now just follow the picture here. All right, so uh, layer number one would be the sand layer at the very top. Why don't we put a density of 20 kilonewton per meter cube there? That'll be the that that will represent a wet sand. <coughs> um, no, I'm sorry, the thickness, the layer thickness first, the density in the second box, and the value of the K0. I'm going to use the value of 0.5 for K0. Click enter, and layer number two, thickness is one, and I'm going to use a density of one. So this has to be the uh, buoyant density or the effective density. Since layer number two is underwater, um, typical density for that is around 10 kilonewton per meter cubed. Layer number three is the clay layer. Thickness of that is 9 meters. And I'm going to keep the density at 10 again. And layer number four is the sand layer at the bottom. Thickness is 5 meters, and I'm still going to keep the density at 10 kilonewton per meter cubed. All right, so we are done with the specification of the initial stresses. Click on the process button, you come out, and then go into the next uh, box here. So uh, there are two constitutive models, I mean one constitutive model with two parameters. So let's pick, uh, pick the first one right there. It basically says even though it is just a linear elastic model, it doesn't really involve any hardening variables, you still have to click enter uh, in order to complete this section. So let's just go ahead and do that. Pick the second one and click enter and make sure that these are listed in the box there. So that way you know that you have done this properly. Uh, Alright, so click on the process button, come out. Now this one says done, this one says done. Click on the process button, come out and the process button is already red so you don't need to really do anything here you can come out to the main form and uh, save the problem next let's work on the output data definition I see you know the finite element method is a very descriptive method yielding a large amount of information at the end of every load increment um, in principle, you can have all of that written out to file for further processing. But depending on the purpose of the analysis and the storage available in your computer, you may not want to have all of that written out. Uh, you may want to pick and choose. And that's the purpose of this uh, interface right here. This graphical user interface uh, divides the output uh, results, uh, the type of output results, into a number of uh, categories here. The first one is called the general output data. Basically includes um, items listed in this box here. 
depending on the availability you can request one or more of this so for the problem at hand let me go ahead and request nodal coordinates connectivity bending element details boundary conditions details material solid element material properties time integration parameters time history data needed um, the load types currently active and finally the solid element material numbers and click enter on the right side here you define the details of four other output types number one initial stresses strains and hardening variables number two data for plotting the mesh number three data for plotting and animating responses number four time history data so let's go through one at a time and talk about the detail now if the analysis involves an elastoplastic model uh, it's worth having the initial values of the hardening variables printed out printed out uh, since we are using an elastic model this is not very useful so I'm just going to click over here um, that means the data will not be written out uh, data for plotting mesh yes it's very important so let's click on on that now this interface basically allows you to uh, choose um, a portion or volume of the domain uh, within which the mesh and the responses are to be uh, uh, plotted later on uh, this again uh, allows you to kind of control the amount of output results that you might end up having in your computer uh, it's particularly useful if the domain is very large and involves large number of nodes and elements um, you can either use a rectangle area or a cylindrical uh, area depending on whether it's a plane strain problem or a um, uh, axisymmetric problem so if you use one of these rectangle areas like this for example the mesh would be uh, written out only within that area uh, since uh, the domain that we have is very small and does not involve uh, too many nodes and elements we would request the full mesh click on the process button come out and the third type has to do with the definition of uh, animations so let's go in there so this is where basically you define the frequency at which the frames or the snapshots are to be written out to files for uh, animating uh, later on uh, so, so let me just go ahead and fill these boxes here I would like the uh, data to be written out starting from increment number one and I would like this to be written out all the way to increment number 5000 this number will make sense in a second uh, after I do the analysis step and uh, I would like the uh, frames to be written out for every uh, 10 uh, load increments so click enter process come out finally the definition of time history data now this is where you define the locations of the nodes, elements, uh, bending elements, etc. where you would like to see some results written out like the nodal displacements, uh, uh, pore pressures at certain nodes and uh, uh, element data like uh, stresses, strains uh, and so on and the bending element data uh, including the axial forces and bending moments and shear forces and so on and let's start with the nodal data what you do is you select a new set and then you come and click over here uh, to select the node let's say I'm interested in uh, having the vertical displacement at the center of the footing printed out so I'm going to click over here and you can see that it, it kind of draws a circle around that node and then you come and select the degree of freedom from this list over here. There are several de degrees of freedom available in general 
but uh, some of them have to do with uh, slip elements which uh, is not active in this particular version. So the decrease, decrease of freedom that are relevant uh, to this version of the software are the solid displacement in the X direction, solid displacement in the Y direction, rotation slash moment, and then finally the pore pressure degree of freedom which is number seven right there. All right, so uh, f for now, I'm interested in the vertical displacement at that node, so the degree of freedom corresponding to that is number two. All right, so when you do that, um, uh, it has selected that uh, uh, particular node and the degree of freedom, and you should see the details right here. It says node number 1103, degree of freedom two, XY coordinate of that is 25 and 16. And that makes sense, right? All right, so in case you have selected this node accidentally, um, you want to remove it, uh, you use this second pull down menu to do that. Like for example, if I click on this, the data will be completely gone. If you come back and look in the first pull down menu, it's not there anymore. So let, let me just do this one more time. So a new set. I click over here, and then I click on that. So now it's back in there. All right. And uh, so similarly, let me just pick a couple of other notes, uh, a new set. And let's say I go over here, and that is the top of the clay layer. And again, I want the vertical displacement printer over there, and then one more set, and I go over here, and I click over here. That'll be the bottom of the clay layer. And the vertical displacement again, and then I pick a, a new set, and, um, and I click over uh, here. All right. That's not exactly the center of the um, clay layer, but it's kind of close. So let me pick that also. All right, so I have selected uh, four nodal output data types to be written out, okay? Now if you click on the mesh here, it'll indicate the location that we have selected. All right, so similarly, let me go over here and select some elements, uh, a new set. Uh, let's say right there, select this element, a new set, and uh, so let me just say somewhere there, select this element, two elements. All right, again, if you click on the mesh, it'll show you the locations. If you come back and click on the mesh for the uh, nodal data, it'll, it'll show you that. So you can kind of flip back and forth there. And uh, just to show you how it is done, let me also pick at least one bending element uh, data type. So you follow the same approach. Let's say I were, I'm interested in this bending element right here at the, at the left end of the footing. So I click over there, it picks that bending element. And uh, and you have to indicate whether you are interested in uh, local note number one or local note number two. So let's just pick uh, note, number, note number one, all right? So now it is indicated right in there. All right, that's it. So now, um, okay, there's one more thing that you have to fill in here which is what we call LP code, line um, print code. Um, well, just print code. So if I type 10 over here, the data will be printed out uh, for every 10 load increment. That's exactly what that means. All right, so now let's click on process. Let me go back to the main interface form and click on the process button over there. Now you can come out to the main pre-processing form. Let's save. Let's now define the load parameters. 
These are the four types of loads uh, that Phoenix FEM currently supports. Earthquake loading, arbitrarily varying loading, sinusoidally varying loading, uh, body force uh, loading. Uh, if you haven't already done so, uh, you should refer to the user's manual on this at least once. Uh, you could do that by uh, going to the help pull down menu and clicking on this item right there, which I have done. So let me just open the user's manual and uh, click on the bookmark and you will see a little table of content. Go down and click on the specification of load parameters and uh, you will see brief descriptions about each of these um, and here is a section on arbitrarily varying load. Um, basically there's a time function defined and then each of the nodal force is multiplied by this time function right here. So I'll let you read on that but for now uh, we want to apply the footing loading um, as a linear function uh, starting from a value of zero going up to a value of 200 kilopascal. Alright, so let's go ahead and click on the arbitrarily varying load types and then um, it also um, allows you to multiply the existing load by a factor uh, this is kind of useful if you want to come back and do a parametric study by increasing the load by a factor of let's say 2 or 3 or even 20 percent or 30 percent or whatever uh, but for now uh, we will type 1 for that and then the number of uh, records in the uh, time function file which is called the arbitrarily file so this file will have an extension ARB and uh, we'll uh, talk about this in a second, but the number of records in this file uh, would be 2 because we just want to go from 0 to 200 kilopascal. So there are uh, a linear function is defined in terms of two points. So click enter here and it basically tells you that you should have a file with this extension uh, with the time function defined in that. Um, Usually what happens is the Phoenix FEM creates a file for you and uh, you, you can uh, modify it uh, as you see fit. So let's just look at um, the set of input files to see if that file uh, exists. Um, so I'm going to click on this and these are the input files that are available at the moment. So let's click on the ARB file and basically have two lines of data uh, line number one and line number two um, so the second column basically defines the time function so time function goes from zero to one and remember these are going to be multiplied by 200 kilopascal so basically um, when it goes from zero to one it actually means the loading goes from zero to 200 kilopascal alright so we do have a uh, good uh, arbitrarily file available and uh, that should serve uh, this particular job. Alright, so we have everything completed here and click on the process button come out and we are done with that step. Alright, let's go ahead and save. Now we are down to the final step of pre-processing which is the analysis parameters step. Let's click on that. Typically there are two types of analysis one can do. A regular analysis or an eigenvalue analysis. Eigenvalue analysis is something that is relevant to um, a dynamic analysis. In some cases uh, you might want to find the uh, first couple of natural frequencies before you actually start the uh, uh, dynamic analysis and that's the purpose of this. So since we are doing static analysis uh, here let me just click on this and it takes you to the primary uh, interface for defining the load segments and some of the other important uh, analysis uh, parameters. So basically you need to have some kind of plan as to how to how you want to apply the loading. 
In our case, some things are pretty clear. We want to apply the footing loading from 0 to 200 pas kilopascal over a certain period of time. And then we want to continue the analysis until the excess pore pressure completely dissipates out of the system. Um, in most cases, uh, you uh, may want to subdivide uh, the uh, dissipation part into a number of load segments. We do that uh, for the purpose of controlling the time step. Uh, what really happens is that in the beginning of the um, uh, analysis, pore pressure dissipates quite rapidly. You want to use smaller time step. And, and uh, later on, the rate of pore water pressure dissipation is, uh, slows down, and uh, you can use larger time step. All right, so you need to have some kind of plan. And you need to do some kind of preliminary calculation in order to come up with a basis for coming up with the time step. So typically, you could use um, um, an estimated uh, value for T infinity. So here I have some calculations, and I'll let you take a look at that. And I came up with a, an estimate for T infinity of 2.83 times 10 to the 7 second. And on that basis, I came up with this plan here. So this plan uh, basically includes five different load segments uh, for the analysis. The first segment is where we apply the loading. And we want to increase the footing pressure over a period of one day um, uh, in one increment. But I do want to use 100 sub-increments there. Now, this is quite arbitrary, one day. It has nothing to do with T infinity. I just came up with that. And then subsequently, we want to continue the pore water pressure dissipation analysis. So here I am using four different uh, load segments to, to do that. Initially, for the first uh, segment, I want to use a time step of 10 to the minus 5 times t infinity, which works out to be 283 seconds. And then for the s subsequent uh, load segment, I want to use a time step which is 10 times bigger, and then 10 times bigger, and then 10 times bigger than the third one. So altogether, total duration of analysis would work out to be about a little over two times t infinity. Hopefully, excess pore, pore pressure uh, would dissipate uh, during this uh, analysis time. Otherwise, we can continue the analysis a little bit more. Let's start typing some numbers here. Let's pick a new set. And the delta t for the first load segment is 86400 seconds. Uh, you don't need to change the integration parameters here, so I recommend that you leave, leave them as is. The load type for the first load, load segment is arbitrary load. Uh, in some cases, you might have done uh, an analysis already, um, and in that case, you might have some initial displacements or strains, and uh, if you want to zero, zero them out, you say yes uh, for these. But in our case, we are uh, starting from scratch, and therefore there will not be any initial displacements or strain. So we say no here. And number of steps for the uh, first load increment is 1. Number of sub-increment is 100. And we are going to start from the first record in the arbitrary load file. Now, this save is different from the save that we have been doing from the file pull-down menu uh, so far. Now, if you click uh, this Save button here, what happens is that the problem in the finite element memory would be completely saved as a binary file. Now, if you want to come back and continue the analysis, then the finite element program will recall the data from this binary file and continue the analysis. So that's the purpose of this save. So at least for the first load increment, we don't need to save. So we say don't save. And then click Add Modify. And it just gives you a little warning um, telling you to make sure that the arbitrary file is available in order to uh, 
perform this operation because remember we clicked on this this option here and that requires an arbitrary file <coughs> excuse me so uh, as um, um, happened in the in the previous form uh, it lists a summary of our choices in this display box here so let's go ahead and pick a new set and the uh, time step for the second uh, load segment is 283 second and it's going to be a free vibration and the number of steps is going to be 1000 at modify new set increase the time step free, vib free vibration 1000 time steps so everything looks fine so click at modify a new set a time step of 283 uh, 28300 0, 0 seconds click on add modify one more step I mean set increase this time step by a factor of 10 at modify and at this stage uh, you may want to click save so that the problem will be saved as a binary file um, alright that's basically it click on the process button you can go back to the main uh, pre-processing form save the problem the graphical user interface would have created all of the necessary input files for conducting the finite element analysis at this point. If you want to confirm that, you go to the view pull down menu and click on the input files tab. It will list the input files that the graphical user interface has created. Uh, the file with the extension DAT, for example, is the primary input file. It has a bunch of commands and numbers. Um, the file with the extension CON is the connectivity file and similarly this is the coordinate file, this is the boundary conditions files and so on. So all of them are in there and now you are ready to uh, perform the finite element analysis. So to do that you go backward and click on this execute Phoenix button and then uh, click on this button because this is the first job for this uh, for this run alright and then click on this button and when you do the standard MS-DOS window will open and you type the name of the job uh, which is TEM1 in my case and then click enter it'll come back and ask you uh, a couple of other questions the first question is whether you would like uh, uh, a command line control or not uh, I would I want to type yes so if you do type yes uh, it'll give you um, uh, some control on whether you want to continue the analysis all the way to the end or whether you want to stop somewhere in the middle uh, on the basis of the results so it gives you a little bit more control uh, so it's better to say yes and uh, and then now it's about to start load segment number one it's asking whether you, you want to continue with load segment number one or not again it gives you a little bit more control so type yes for that it'll start uh, doing the calculations finite element calculations and you'll see some numbers crawling on the window um, um, and then you wait until it is done. Of course it's going to come back and ask you a couple more questions because we have five different load segments and every time it goes from one load segment to the other it's going to ask you whether you want to continue or not. Um, so you have the option to say uh, yes or no. Alright, so as per the numbers that you see on the screen, uh, the first column basically uh, is the uh, cumulative uh, load increments and the second column 
is the load segment so he it has just completed load segment number one and the third column lists the load factor so the load factor goes from zero to one uh, for this particular load segment and you can see that it went from point one all the way to one over here and then the the remaining columns um, depends on what type of analysis that you are doing um, in our case since it's a fooding type loading uh, the, f the the first of the the last two columns is going to be the displacement at the first nodal result that we requested as part of the nodal data definition All right, so that's a displacement at that point so if you recall uh, that was the center of the footing so this is the vertical displacement at the center of the footing and uh, and the last column lists the corresponding load at that particular node in that particular direction so this is the vertical load at the midpoint of the footing all right so that's how you interpret these numbers so these numbers tell you a little bit about exactly what is happening uh, whether uh, the results are converging nicely uh, whether the displacement is uh, exceeding a certain limit and so on so on the basis of that in some cases you might want to just stop the analysis because the displacement has become too large or something like that all right um, so wait until it uh, the analysis is stopped uh, before you can before you go ahead and post process the data I do have another video on post processing and I would like you to watch that uh, this concludes this video and thank you for watching